Hey everybody, this is Josh Valentine with the Clean Coalition. Thanks for joining the webinar today, Electrification 101. It's part of our North Bay Community Resilience Initiative. Um, we have a number of more webinars coming up in the next few months, so we'll be uh, sending emails out about those, so look out for that. Um, just before we get started, I'd like to go through some technical functions for GoToWebinar. Um, the, the webinar recording and slides will be sent to all registered attendees within two business days. And um, if you have a question, we have a Q&A session that will be happening at the end of the presentations. So if you want a, a question answered, submit it into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll try our very best to get to it. Um, all webinars are archived on our website, clean-coalition.org, and on our YouTube channel. And if you have any uh, specific questions, direct them to info at clean-coalition.org. You can also send it to me at josh at clean-coalition.org. So I'm gonna introduce you to John Sarter. He's a program manager here at Clean Coalition. And uh, we're gonna get started with John right away. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, let me get into my slideshow mode here. Sorry about that. Today's webinar is on electrification and decarbonization in the built environment, energy, and transportation sectors. And we're going to touch on nanogrids, microgrids, and community microgrids as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the North Bay Community Resilience Initiative. Our goals in this are to track, publicize, and support cutting edge resilience, creating efficiency, electrification, and microgrid incentives and policy advancements by local government agencies to procure and de develop a database of model structures with community microgrid ready designs for new and retrofit residential, commercial, and municipal buildings, to develop a community microgrid roadmap beginning with critical facility microgrid pilots such as fire stations, hospitals, and places of refuge, and to develop all of these as a model for decarbonization through electrification, creating resilience in rebuilding and proactive resilience for community modernization. We're going to start off with Sean Armstrong from Redwood Energy. Um, this is Sean's screenshot, and uh, I'll turn it over to Sean. Take it away, Sean. Well, good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, let's see here. If I could show my screen. Perfect. All right. Hey, everybody. So we're going to go into the question and the solution. Uh, the question is, well, you know, why are we having wildfires, hurricanes, really all sorts of extreme climate events? It's because we're burning so much fuel generally. Fuel in buildings is in the range of 30% of all climate change. And that includes its leakages. So we're looking for a cleaner, safer, less expensive lifestyle. Introduce myself. Hi. Um, I do live on a farm. I'm a farm boy from rural Wisconsin. I'm now a farm boy in Northern California. We have pigs. Um, I started off professionally working at the Campus Center for Appropriate Technology in 1995. I became a co-director and that was an off-grid house at the time. Um, then went into construction support. Uh, I've actually had a little career as a high school science teacher, which I loved, and then went into construction. So uh, helping build zero net energy affordable housing. When I started in as a consultant with my partner, Michael Winkler, um, we started picking up awards for doing 100% solar powered affordable housing, including the grand prize from the United Nations for mutual housing at Spring Lake phase one, which is the first permanent affordable housing built for farm workers in Yolo County where almonds are grown and picked. And the zero net energy part of it is actually the key part of the financing that made it get over the finish line. So um, <clears throat> it was important that it actually that's how the <clears throat> pardon me that's how the project got funded here's an analogy we are about to go through the same kind of transition that america went through over about 15 years between having dead horses on the street about 5,000 a year in new york city people leave them behind uh, they'd only live for three years they're abused terribly a horse can live easily for 30 years uh, there is feces in the street so thick that you had people shovel it for you if you were wealthy enough to have a personal shoveler 
there were two acres of land per horse. They were expensive. Uh, they were difficult to deal with. And, and cars were sold as something that was less expensive and less anxiety inducing. We've seen this transition many times in our own personal history. You might have had some experiences with the internet, the advent of it, or the advent of cell phones, um, but you've seen it as well with color TVs, with vehicles themselves, refrigerators, all sorts of things take about 15 years to get the job done. The United States began electrifying in earnest in about 1993. That's when uh, market share growth of all electric buildings began to grow. We're at more than half now in the American South, which is where four in 10 ho homes are built in the United States. 40% of our homes are built in the South <clears throat> and they're more than 50% all electric now. This is because it's cheaper to build all electric. And since uh, we've gotten some really great high quality heat pumps for cold climates, we've seen market growth over the entire country in a nonpartisan non way. This is not political. It's just people deciding to build a less expensive home because most homes are built by developers. So this is savvy builders choosing to build all electric. This is what a developer sees on the left-hand side. In dark blue are cost additions for putting gas into a building. The furnace costs more than a heat pump, which is just a reversible air conditioner. So if you have a furnace and an air conditioner, that's more expensive by three grand than just getting a reversible air conditioner, quote unquote, a heat pump. Water heaters are about the same price. Dryers are a little bit more expensive. Stoves are a little bit more expensive. The costs start adding up though for infrastructure. So the plumbing in the walls is quite expensive. The, the lateral from the street, also a very significant expense, $16,000 in California. It might be as little as $1,500 in like rural Utah, but usually in the range of five to $10,000 per house, you bet. And then if you're developing subdivisions, all of the gas piping in the streets, $141 and north of that per linear foot. So we're talking many thousands per lot of two inch piping. Now everything to the right in light blue are things that are rate based. You still have to pay for them, but you pay for it in a loan that's repaid by your utility bill. It's important, by the way, to stop the infrastructure development, which are these loans that we take out for 40 years with bonds. On our behalf, utilities take out these loans and then we, we pay them in our utility bills. If we stop them from building infrastructure that we don't want in 40 years, we make a significant contribution towards reducing leaks now and our own bills. I wanna focus on leaks. This is an important insight. In California, more than 80% of our gas comes from the rest of the country. We are the number one user of gas in the United States. We have the number one hookups for gas in the United States. We are a petro state. We have about 86% of all homes in California use gas and only 14% are all electric or wood and electric. So we have a problem here in California. This problem is due because all of the leaks associated with our gas supply here, but just generally, the leaks associated with methane are more profound than the combustion of it. So it's worse that you're even getting it than it is that you're burning it. Look to the left-hand side of this graph where you see in dark green, this is our current best understanding of what is happening over the next 20 year horizon, which is that almost half of the climate change we're gonna experience is going to be because of methane leaks, not combustion. On the bottom is all the combined combustion in gray. In dark green, that's the methane leaks, which you're seeing on the right-hand side range between like two and 17% for different gas fields in our country. And it's true all over the world where methane has gotten out of the ground. There's this huge amounts of leaks associated with the getting it and the delivering of it, and somewhat with the burning. <clears throat> so, if we can shut off this specific gas, we avoid a tremendous amount of near-term climate change. We can't do a whole lot about carbon dioxide, which is other than grow trees, right? And grow algae and grow grass, just grow stuff. But for stopping the problem, we can do a lot of work of shutting off methane gas fields as quickly as we can. 
Once it's inside our house, now it starts causing us problems. On the right-hand side, you see the dirtiest outdoor air in the United States. This is testing next to power plants and highways. On the left-hand side, you see what the California Air Resources Board found when they tested air quality in kitchens for nitrogen dioxide, one of the three chemicals that are regulated by the Clean Air Act. So you see that cooking food oils on an electric dish gets you some air pollution, not as dirty as outside air. But once you start cooking even one dish on gas, you've exceeded the dirtiest outside air. And cooking a whole meal, you're now up into seriously hazardous amounts of nitrogen dioxide, far beyond the federal limits. You know, federal limits at 100 ppb. Not only does nitrogen dioxide cause real problems in people's health, really more about asthma, and you're seeing this here, it also causes cancer. One of the 340 chemicals that are created by burning gas in your kitchen that is usually not vented, even with the vents on, vents don't work very well, especially if you're not cooking on the, sec on the back two burners or cooking on the front two burners, they barely work at all, even when on. So formaldehyde, the number one source of formaldehyde is our gas stoves. We have eliminated formaldehyde and in insulation in our buildings for about almost a decade now. So now, number one source is our stoves. It's how it's burnt, and as a consequence, formaldehyde, which is so incredibly poisonous that you can preserve living organisms, well, dead organisms for hundreds of years, nothing else can live in there, uh, it's, it's really rough on people, and on kids and pets specifically, because they have three to four times as much ventilation per body volume as an adult. They breathe a lot more, cats, dogs, and kids. <clears throat> At, in large amounts, you know, gas is full on incredibly dangerous. Uh, in California, after earthquakes, half of our fires are because of gas line breaks. So half of the fire responders out there are dealing with gigantic explosions, explosions and huge fires that are caused by gas breaks. Then sometimes people hit a gas line in accident in the middle, you know, in San Bruno, that was because of a lack of tracking of where the pipes were. Um, we have huge invisible leaks that come off of um, storage facilities, both at the fields, like the gas fields, and this one is a long-term storage facility, because just so you know, we have to have huge gas batteries in order to run our cities in California. If we didn't have the four gigantic underground chambers to store our gas, we would not have enough gas in the wintertime. We would have to shut off parts of our city. People think that gas is this very resilient thing, but actually it's dangerous and we don't have enough in the wintertime when we need it anyway. And we really do terrific benefits if we stopped trying to use gas in the wintertime. Because you can see Aliso Canyon, the largest gas leak that we know of in the United States ever. Um, that went on for almost half a year, poisoned thousands of people. And it kind of needs to be next to the city, but it's so dangerous there. And then there's climate change. Um, <clears throat> Nancy Peck is my mother-in-law. And uh, she's one of the people who passed away in the Santa Rosa fires. And she was a climate change activist. That's how she raised my wife. It was one of the things that, you know, bonded us as a family is our commitment to environmental activism. And, you know, my kids really miss her. And you know, when people talk about the, the Armageddon to come, uh, we have had three years and more than 100 people die directly in these fires. And thousands of buildings burned down. And last year, 700,000 people moved out of California. Uh, I don't know where they're going to because I know the next place they're going to has tornadoes that have increased or have hurricanes. There's, there's no safe place from climate change. Like the intense turbidity of our atmosphere means that everywhere we go, there's problems. So I want to applaud the bravery and the, the leadership of Berkeley, where they just ban gas and all new construction. Now, new construction is only about 1% of our, our buildings every year. So obviously the work to be done is to address our existing buildings, but this is how we start. And now um, the communities that are like Cambridge, Massachusetts, this is where Harvard and MIT are, they're trying to ban natural gas and new construction also. So is Brookline, so is Newton, the communities around Boston. Tremendous gas leakage in Boston from existing gas pipelines has been documented. Explosions from old gas leaks. 
of cities have the ability to say no to the building permit that is asked for by a developer to put gas piping in the building. Utilities can control the streets and laterals. Cities are absolutely sovereign over the issue of public safety inside of buildings, that's theirs. So they can say no more gas piping in buildings. It's too explosive. It, it causes too much harm to the residents. It's too dangerous after natural disasters for us to have to mobilize firefighters. And it really pairs well with the fact that in California next year, all new housing has to have a solar array on it that can handle about two thirds of the whole house's energy load. Um, so if you assume that it's an electric and gas house, it's an all electric solar offset and then they leave about 40% for gas to be there as an allowance. And if you have an all electric house, you're still only have to do about 60% 60, 60 offset. But of course it makes sense to do 100% on, on the, your bill. That's it's a financial investment with like a five year payback. Has big carbon paybacks too. This is an apartment complex we supported some years back. Um, we've worked on more than 200 apartment complexes that are trying to do solar rays and all electric. Um, so this is one of many, but we have nice information on it. We could see that over a year we were 94% zero net energy. You can see on the upper left hand corner what it looks like day by day. There's about four months that we used energy from the grid and eight months that we provided it. And then on the bottom you can see in yellow, this is when we were producing enough energy to offset greenhouse gas impacts in the grid. And we were actually a little bit overcompensating. So we were 99% zero carbon. And that's exciting to see that we were affecting the grid during some of the worst hours of the day and a benefit to the grid even more than our energy was. Some people worry about solar causing a problem um, with the quote unquote duck curve. This is clear that actually this is still a solution in the evening. We're causing more of a solution than say the peaker gas grids are causing the solution. We are the solution in the evening still. So Berkeley's not alone. There's 16 cities now in California that have passed it. There's four that are talking about it this week. Um, we're expecting somewhere in the range of 60 different cities around California in the next few months are gonna be passing ordinances that either um, strongly encourage all electric through various code mechanisms and fines and fees, or just outright ban putting gas into various building types. But one of the national trends that's so exciting on the bottom there, New York Times, New York rejects Keystone like pipeline and fierce battle over the state's energy future. <clears throat> what this means is that areas of north of the Bronx and Queens, they have had to go all electric, like uh, White Plains. Um, now this has been going on for almost two years, apartment complexes, restaurants, and it's finally been resolved where the state has insisted the utility provide services one way or another, but still no gas pipeline. So they're the language is like, we don't exactly know how to do that. The solution, of course, is to incentivize all electric construction and just provide them the energy services they need. This makes sense for people financially. Uh, this is tribal housing up in Hoopa. First housing that the state has ever financed for a tribe was this project here. Um, part of its financing was dependent upon the solar array. Once again, it needed the solar array. So the solar array provided these benefits to the tenants where we were able to get $5 utility bills for these low income seniors or low income elders, I should say. Um, if we had used the propane, which is normal out there at the reservation, we would have had a total bill of $79. If it had been all electric, which is super efficient, it would have been less, $59. And putting the solar arrays on, got it down to $5. Um, this is farm worker housing, single family homes out in like, this is a uh, raisin country, Selma. This is what it looks like. Uh, on the left hand side, you see a reversible air conditioner called a heat pump, but it's just that, a reversible air conditioner. You see a little uh, fan coil box there in the middle. That's for blowing air through ducts. You see that the heat pump water heater. So that has a little um, air conditioner essentially on top. It blows cold air at you. But the, the heat that, that is not there is in the water tank below. It's heating up a refrigerant that's wrapped around in copper pipes around the tank. And the right hand side, you can see the fairly even energy balance, which is actually dominated by plug loads, even though this is a single family home. But it's built to Energy Star for homes and it's lead platinum. And you see um, 
we don't have this disproportionate HVAC load like you see often. It's very well insulated and sealed. These are what stoves look like. <clears throat> so a lot of people like electric stoves because you can clean them off easily. On the top, you see high quality electric resistance stoves with smooth tops, so they're radiant underneath. On the bottom, you see higher quality stoves, they're induction. And induction heats up faster, by like twice as fast compared to electric range above, but they both get there. Um, it's just more responsive. It can pour more power into heating. But these days, electric resistance are getting much better than the, the ones of the bad old days. So uh, induction is what we have in our own house. I don't have a big stove like this. My mom does, but I use a two burner that I got off the internet for $200. <laughs> and I have two of them in my kitchen and just plug them into the plugs in the wall. And I do all of my cooking and I'm, you know, we have a farm here. I cook so much food, uh, but it's actually nice. I've got two cooking stations instead of having one like I would with this. So I, my wife and I can cook at the same time in different parts of the kitchen, works out better. This is uh, both a, like, this is fun for parties. So if you're looking in the, sort of in the, the middle of it to the left, you'll see this little white box and that it has flames in it. This is mist lit with LEDs and it really looks like flame. It, it's scary to stick your hands in it. You feel like you're doing a magic trick, um, but it really looks like flame. And most of these have heaters. There's also like in the middle here, the classic flame felicity. That's for outside patios. So instead of getting one of those carbon monoxide headaches you get at parties when you're all having like chips or wine or whatever underneath propane heaters and you get gassed and you start feeling lightheaded. I've had this many times, I'm tall. So that might be because I'm closer to it, but I do get gassed um, and it makes me sick. So this is an electric outdoor heater. <laughs> it's like you plug them in and you can stand close to that and get warm. Uh, if you're into radiant floors, these are products for you, just so you know. Heat pumps. Uh, these are smaller water heaters. This is what you have in your house, generally. If on the left-hand side, the sand in, if you have one of those gigantic bathtubs that like looks like an eggshell, like Mork and Mindy kind of eggshell, you're not going to have enough hot water in almost any water heater. <laughs> um, but the Sanko over there, this is designed for that kind of sitting tub in Japan where first you take a shower to clean off, then you get in a 50 gallon bathtub of hot water. So the Sandin, which is uh, one of the six different CO2 refrigerant heat pump water heaters over in Japan, um, Mitsubishi and uh, I, I mean Panasonic, Sanyo, everyone makes them there. Only Sandin has brought um, like a really low global warming potential. CO2 is the best of the refrigerants here. The other ones are 2000 times the global warming potential if the refrigerant leaks. Which, to be fair, if all that refrigerant leak, that's still the same amount of climate change that comes from burning and leaking from just one gas water heater. So all that refrigerant goes up in the air equals the CO2 impact of burning a water heater and the 2 to 5% methane leakage associated with that water heater all upstream. So just you know, to put this in perspective, these refrigerants are bad, but they just one year of operating your water heater is worse than the worst thing you could do here. That said, over on the left-hand side is the CO2, <laughs> and it works well outside, which is nice if you have a, an outside application, it works in the snow. <clears throat> These are cheaper to operate. On the left-hand side, you can see a heat pump water heater is literally off the scale at $161. The scale is set by gas. Over on the right-hand side was a product I found that was like exactly equivalent in its size and its quality and all that kind of stuff. I tried to get a, something that was the lowest usage that was just like this tank. And not only was it more expensive to purchase, but you can see I couldn't quite get one that was as cheap to even be at the very lowest end of the scale, pardon me. But electric is off the scale for average bills in the United States. Uh, way off the scale if it's, you're using a solar array up there because that's very cheap electricity, about one third the cost of retail on the grid if you have a decent deal with your utility. It's superior to solar thermal. You know, uh, this is a friend of mine who's, who grows pineapples and, and sugar cane and has a rope swing into the swimming pool that's inside of that greenhouse where he grows all those wonderful things. And he had been using solar thermal for about $30,000 to put in that array. And instead for $5,000 installed, $3,000 purchased, 
you put in a heat pump water heater, which used less energy <clears throat> total. He had to do gas with that solar thermal system. This can operate in the winter time, whereas the other one, it just went into full on gas in the winter. And he has a solar PV array that it was very modest to purchase, about $1,000 worth of PV offset all of his need. So he had like a $6,000 pool heater that also worked in the winter time, as opposed to a $30,000 one using solar thermal. And this is what he wanted. This is what he moved to. He's very satisfied with it. He can remote control his swimming pool so that when he shows up, he's got it at you know 90 degrees and he can get in and swim. He's an older fellow. He really appreciates it. So you can't do that necessarily with other systems, but with a heat pump, it's a computer and you can tell it what you'd like it to do. And it does it at a 400 to 600% efficiency. I uh, meaning one unit of electricity in gets you four to six units of heat from the outside environment with these pool heaters. So incredibly efficient. <clears throat> Here we have water heaters again, but these are for apartment buildings. Um, you see the sand and I mentioned the carbon dioxide one. And over on the right hand side, we have um, ones that use standard HVAC refrigerant, which is called 410A. Um, and they're all for different needs, different scales, different jobs, but basically they are heating hot water with refrigerant and the air. So uh, the sand in is about 400% efficient. And the ones on the right here are generally in the range of 300 to 350% efficient. This is John's project. I apologize, John, because I just want to do it credit. This is a beautiful development. And one of the coolest things about it is that it can go off grid. It's a small micro grid, the building itself. And John is also helping us uh, move forward with doing vehicle to building charging. So he's uh, representing a project, a product called Decibel. Basically, it takes the car electricity, which might be 60 kilowatt hours, <clears throat> and in a day, you might use one kilowatt hour for cooking food. So, or you have a Tesla Powerwall, which is a 14 kilowatt hour battery. So if you use one to two kilowatt hours for all of your hot water showering, like normal life, and you're doing one kilowatt hour for cooking, you can see how with your car, you know, I have a friend, for instance, who does this, and he says, I have a 90 mile range. He has a smaller car, not like a 250 mile range. He's like, I've got a 90 mile range. And during the power outage, we were using two miles per night powering our whole house. It's like, I have 90 miles on it. I can definitely afford two miles a night. It's like, and he has a solar array. <laughs> so he's powering it up during the day anyway. So that strategy, which is um, you know popular in Japan, it helps them survive tsunamis and earthquakes for real. Um, that's where it really started back as a, as a product for sale as opposed to an innovation by home technicians. Um, and now it's very relevant in California. Uh, here it is. You can see there's four different car companies, um, Chevy, Renault, uh, Nissan, and Kia, that have said yes, they'll let their cars be used as um, backup for people's homes. Wanted to just sort of show you what that would look like. Cars store 60 to 100 kilowatt hours a day, generally. You know, like a, a $30,000 car, 30 to 40,000. Apartments, they use 13 to 19 kilowatt hours per day on average. You can see there's a wide range. People live very different lifestyles in their homes. It's something to just note. <clears throat> that said, the low range is at five kilowatt hours. And it goes up from five to about 11. That's the least amount that people can use. Up to six people in their home. Catch that? <clears throat> so if you have 60 kilowatt hours, and in one day, if you just don't use a lot of energy, don't watch the TV all day, you know, like turn most things off and just hang out in your house like you're a frugal person, you can have six people in your home with 11 kilowatt hours, and you yourself could get by with about five and you have 60 to 100 stored in your car. I just wanted to illustrate this again, what cooking loads look like, which is basically one and a half to two and a half kilowatt hours for average cooking. And you can see that on the low side, people who don't cook very much, you know, they can use almost none. And people who cook a lot use three, four, five, you know, right at the tippy top, five kilowatt hours out of 60. 
Now, a different challenge, not just resiliency, but if you want to electrify your home, what do you have there to work with? There's a certain amount of power. Your house probably has 100 amps, but if you live in a trailer home or a very old apartment, you might have 50. And if you live in a relatively new home, like in the last mm, 10, 20 years, um, you might or probably have a 200 amp. It really depends upon the builder. And if you live in a very large home, you might have 400 amps. If you don't have enough power, you want to like take all your gas load, the stove, the dryer, the water heater, the furnace, maybe the hot tub. You know, If you want to take your gas loads or your sauna and you want to electrify them, you can do that with these sub panels that will balance power. Like maybe you don't have enough power delivered to your house, but these will, with a computer, turn off the water heater for 15 minutes or not charge your car for half an hour. Like they can allow other peak loads to happen and use things that inherently have a battery. Like your refrigerator turns off for two hours at a time naturally. That's just how it works. So you can turn off the refrigerator for two hours and it's nothing has changed. Um, so that's, that's a way, an inexpensive way to just get the job done without having to have the utility come out and deliver a new line to your house and have to put a new panel. Just do a sub panel and, and do load balancing with it. Here's what load balancing plugs look like. So it's smaller, easier. Literally just plug it into the plug that's there so you can load balance between the water heater and the car charger and the dryer. Um, one's called Dryer Buddy, <laughs> the other one's called Neo Charge. Or you could free up that plug that 30 amp electric plug that you might have there for a dryer or a car charger <clears throat> by getting, well, getting rid of the dryer. The dryer doesn't have to be that the way it is. All over Eurasia, this is how people dry their laundry. They put it in dry into a washing machine that also dries their laundry. And so three hours later, instead of having to forward it or clean the lint trap, you know, halfway through the drying cycle and start it over again because it got clogged, this does the whole job. It's uh, low temperature, it dehumidifies as opposed to heating and boiling the, the steam, and like steaming essentially is what's going on in a gas dryer. This dehumidifies, so it's gentler on your clothing and it flushes the water down a, a drain as opposed to having a big vent blow it out your house. So it's easier to plumb. It does everything. You know, if you have a water there and you already have a washing machine drain, this just goes there. You know, it uses that same drain but it's so low power. It's not like 7,000 watts, it's 1,400 watts. It's like a hair dryer on medium. So you can plug it literally into any outlet in your house. This is how most people in Eurasia do it. And this is something that's coming to us. This is also in Eurasia, but um, not in North America yet, uh, but it's on its way. So these are 20 to 30 gallon tanks. If you store them at a hotter temperature at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, they're just like a 40 gallon tank. And they also can plug into any outlet in your home. So you don't have to rewire your house or rewire your panel or any other expensive thing. You just plug it into your already existing outlets. Done. <clears throat> Code compliant, no drama. You know, wherever you have a plug and water, you can put a water heater. Similarly, low drama, no drama retrofits for your space heating. On the left hand side and right hand here, these are two different approaches to just once again plugging it into your wall. And both of these can heat a house. Um, this, both of these, this is the, the um, HVAC production from my house, which is 1100 square feet and only so so insulated because it's a 100 year old house. So on the left-hand side, this is um, called Innova, I-N-N-O-V-A. It's coming out for sale in January for $1,950. On the right-hand side, this is Mitsubishi's. And so they have a plug-in, and others do, like Sanyo, Gree, um, 150, just like plug-it-in products. And these range about $1,500, but you have to install a refrigerant line, and that usually costs $1,000 more. So it's not necessarily cheaper, but it has flexibility. Compressor sits outside, fan coil sits wherever you want it to go. People are choosing to go all electric at restaurants. 
if you're going to Europe to a fancy Michelin starred restaurant up in the mountains, it's an all electric restaurant. This is how fine dining is done in Europe. They go find some gorgeous place and then they bring in their induction ranges. So these are all in New York. On the right-hand side, you can see Solo with their induction walks. That's how they do this really fancy pasta restaurant in New York City, induction walks. And the oyster bar, and you can see the induction panel underneath the little sheep Mongolian hot pot. That's how everyone has their own induction cooker at your, your spot where you're sitting, and then you boil your food in the, the hot pot, and it's delicious. And you see a bunch of diners. French fries at diners. During lunch hour, if you have a gas French fryer, it can only get it cooks fries for four minutes, and then it has one minute to reheat before you can dump in the next basket of frozen fries. An electric fryer is already back up to heated temperature at three minutes of the four minute heating cycle of cooking French fries. So you take the basket out and you immediately dump in another basket of fries without waiting for a minute. So this increases productivity by 25% of French fries during lunchtime rush hours which actually makes a difference to restaurants with limited space and kitchens. How much french fries can they produce? And they fry lots of things with those. So electric fryers are a significant increase in productivity for restaurants trying to sell a lot of food. And they're also just fine for luxury resorts. You know, all over Hawaii, most uh, Waikiki Beach is built all electric. They didn't even have natural gas service to Waikiki Beach during you know, the time in which um, Elvis was out there. You know, every place beautiful is built all electric. Many of them still are. Some of them have gotten gas service, which is so expensive. And many of them are like, we don't need it. We'll just, you know, get better electric stuff. So they put in electric heat pump water heaters instead of their electric boilers. Or they put an induction kitchen in, like this one, the Hyatt Regency. Or the Hilton Hawaii Village. You know, all of their um, condos, you know, for sale, rentals, timeshare condos, all that stuff. It's all, all electric. And, and that's true of literally dozens. I had my staff call like dozens of places to confirm that they were all electric. And that is sort of my comprehensive view for you. Uh, we have enough time for questions. And um, I, I hope that wasn't too fast. I'm more than happy to go back to the slides and, you know, dig in deeper. So that's it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. Um, and I should say, uh, I'm very sorry to hear about your mother-in-law. That that's a, 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 um, a terrible loss. And, um, and It's I, hard. You know, yeah. she just died. Uh, it's going to be in a few weeks. And she lingered in the hospital for a couple of weeks with lung failure and all the tubes in her. And just it was just grisly. It was just the kind of death that makes you wish that things went faster. Um, so, yeah, it actually, yeah, it really, it's one of those things like the family has encouraged me to, to say this as a part of my presentations to honor her passing because she was an environmentalist and, you know, she donated her body to science and she donates her story to science, you know, to people understanding what's actually happening um, to real people. Yeah, and it, and it's 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 reality, and it's what's happening in in the, in, the, in the state now and and all over the country. So um, once again, I'm very sorry to hear that, and uh, we we uh, we very much appreciate your presentation. Um, we're gonna go through some questions uh, from some users, and again, um, these slides and the uh, recording of this uh, the the video will be on our website, and we will be sending it uh, via email. Um, so you can go through it at your leisure. So um, the if first we question. To, we should um, go back to John first. I believe he has a little more to present as well. Oh, you do? Okay. I have a few more slides. John? It would be great if we can do that real quick. Yep. Sorry about that, John. I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, John, for that great presentation. And we will get to the questions pretty quickly here. Uh, I just wanted to go through a couple of, of other slides real quick to talk about um, the kind of critical need that we have to enhance resilience in the current situation we're in, uh, particularly here in California with the PSPS events. We have a really phenomenal opportunity to enhance resilience as we electrify. And the way to do this is to add distributed energy resources or DERS as they call them at the building and community level. And Sean touched on this a bit about uh, the project uh, in the city that we did and, and also the new technology of vehicle to home energy that's coming very 
soon, uh, first quarter of next year, actually. Um, so distributed energy resources, DERS, uh, include both generation and energy storage assets. So generation is solar, wind, hydro, and geothermal in different situations. And then you can have energy storage uh, and these distributed generation assets, both at the building and community level. So in a building, you have stationary energy storage systems, such as the batteries here in Solex Alpha, and this, this home had batteries also, an LG Chem battery. Um, you can actually also use the electric vehicles, as we talked about, as energy storage and give that power back later, um, starting early next year. You can use the appliances to actually store energy. You can preheat your home and your water heater. And the building itself, it's a, if it's efficient, becomes a thermal battery of sorts. So you can preheat or pre-cool your home when the power is optimal during the day, during solar generation, and then use that energy at night. So at the community level, you have energy storage um, in the form of large battery systems, sometimes a pumped hydro system that will pump water up a hill with solar power during the day and then let it come back and turn generators at night. And then you can also aggregate the systems that are on the building level into kind of a virtual power plant, they call it. So it becomes a, 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 an aggregated resource that you can use um, for the grid or for a community microgrid. And also then aggregate the electric vehicle fleets as well in the same way, using the bi-directional capability that Sean talked about earlier. So in that regard, as we electrify, the, the Clean Coalition, along with a team of industry experts such as EPRI, Berkeley, uh, LVNL, uh, general microgrids and others have developed a document we call the Electrification Community Microgrid Ready document, or ECMR. We developed this as a guideline for homeowners, trades installers, and electrical engineers to easily plan and install the necessary wiring and communications to be all electric and also community microgrid ready. It's a simple four-page document that has uh, the first two pages define the microgrid operations or nano grid for a single family or single residence um, on how it works when it's connected to the grid and when it's disconnected. The second page has suggested wiring for connected appliances, mm. um, solar and ready and energy storage ready, um, and then connectivity to the grid or microgrid that you can potentially be a, um, share energy within the community with. And then also some additional recommendations for commercial buildings. Page three shows the cost to wire for electrification. And then page four has the cost, the additional cost to wire to be community microgrid ready. And the important thing that the cost of this, these two combined to the wiring is around $1,000. I borrowed this, this slide from Sean's presentation. It costs about $25,000 per home for gas infrastructure and piping within the home. And if you take a look at that $25,000 and you back out the cost of to, to wire for this ECMR, electrification and community microgrid ready, you're saving about $24,000. So that $24,000 can really go a long way towards or even pay for the cost of your solar and storage system or a solar plus vehicle to home system, which gives you the resilience that we need and the ability to interconnect into a larger community microgrid down the line. So re renewable energy community microgrids really represent a safer, cleaner, and more resilient energy future for all of California, from the building scale to the community scale, and even up to grid scale. And that's it for my slides. So let's take some questions. All right, great. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. All right, so why don't we get through some of these questions. Uh, from Christina Benz, who is with Napa Climate Now. Uh, 350 Bay Area Group. Uh, she's just asking, uh, Sean, uh, what's the cost of a farm, or a farm worker housing in Selma per unit? <clears throat> um, the homes are generally built for about $160 a square foot. So it, they range between, say, 800 square foot homes and 1,450 square foot homes for a four bedroom. Uh, but $160 a square foot if you're building in the city, as you build up, just to understand, costs increase as you go up. It doesn't decrease, they increase per square foot. But you get more use for a piece of land. So building the same building as a, a two-story or a three-story construction 
means not $160, but closer to 250 350 You know, as you get denser, with actually with more bathrooms and more people, as you get more dense, uh, it, the cost per square foot goes up. So, but that's so at the ground level, you can build for about $160 a square foot of zero net energy lead platinum farm worker housing. Great, thank you. So, Michael Winkler, uh, he's a board chair, uh, Redwood Coast Energy Authority. He has more of a statement than a question. If you'd like to address it, great. If not, we'll move on to the next one. Um, Michael says, you can also lower the cost of running a heat pump water heater by using it with time of use rates and a timer. Any <laughs> comments on that? Well, Michael is, is one of the leaders in our state on thinking about how to use water heaters as battery, and, and he runs his own water heater that way. So, yeah, he's right on. I mean, particularly with time of use rates coming up, Michael, who's my partner, <laughs> and I have um, studied what time of use rates would do because we see very high variability between individual apartments who are otherwise identical in their occupancy and where they are in the building and everything else. They're the same yet they have hugely different energy use patterns. And I personally worry about what's gonna to happen to lots of people who use energy in a natural way in the evening because they're shift workers or they have lots of children or things that are natural and not shameful. But um, as we locate the costs and we no longer average them and we really push the costs on a real per hour basis, I think that people need to invest in more strategies to save energy like the water heater, like as John Sarter said, preheating or pre-cooling their home during the solar maximum of the day when energy prices will be cheaper. Because um, yeah, it worries me. I, I think the utilities are getting a good deal out of this as a way to significantly raise rates in a way that um, affects people in a not particularly fair way. It'll happen, <laughs> but the fairness is more for the utility, not for the people. Great. Right. In addition to that, you can use the same strategy for charging your batteries in off-peak times. If you have a stationary storage uh, system or your vehicle, charge in off-peak EV rate times when you're paying six cents a kilowatt hour and use it the next day when the rate might be 32 cents or something. So there's a huge opportunity to really save money with these systems and create resilience for your home and community at the same time. I look forward to when we have really wide scale adoption of electric cars over the next five years or so, um, because the resource of that battery is going to be so helpful for people. Now that we have mandated solar on people's homes for new construction, and these are people who will be buying electric cars, um, I mostly worry about what we're going to do about retrofits, all the rest of the people that are around. But I, I mean, it sounds like the decibel product, John, right? That goes on existing homes. So people could use their their, yeah, so you, their, their electric car you now. Can, you don't even have to. So you can hook it up to a home and you can take your electric vehicle and charge it at work or on your way home and power your house all through the night and still have plenty of range the next day. As a matter of fact, I have a house that's completely covered with trees and so I really can't put solar on it. But I plan to put one of these units in my house so I can just have that capability for, for backup power. Right. And load shipping. People are not at home during the day, most people, right? It seems to me like if they're out with their car, they should be charging up someplace that has solar power available to it and bring it home, kind of, right? You know, like bring that energy, yeah. that solar energy, where the car was, where the solar rays were, and bring it home and, and then help out. Like having a solar ray on top of your roof but not actually using that energy during the day is, is good, but it's not, you know, not the whole solution. Um, yeah, I like that, your approach to it. That's cool. I, I have a, a client who's doing an off-grid house up on a mountaintop in Napa, who similarly is going to be using electric cars to bring energy home because um, they want to be off-grid in the wintertime. Thanks, guys. And I, I had a feeling Michael was, uh, I had a curious feeling he was affiliated with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the next question is from Chris Carrick. Uh, Chris is an energy program manager for the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board. Cool. Um, Chris asks, in the meeting where Mountain View banned natural gas in new construction, one of, the, one of the counselors noted 
reports that all electric homes may not reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Is anyone aware of this info? Misinfo? <laughs> I mean, that's silly. There, every <laughs> single study that's come out from all of the reputable firms all across the state, so E3, everything that the utilities have paid for or the Energy Commission has paid for, or the Public Utilities Commission or the NRDC, Environmental Defense Fund, Sierra Club, private backyard scientists, no one can make a, can agree that that is true. That's just silliness. Uh, it is true that if you put in a heat pump, you use you know half or a third as much climate change impact on the grid. Uh, even in a coal state like West Virginia, where it's 96% coal in the grid, if you're using a heat pump, you'd be using it at 300% uh, efficiency, for instance, at least. And that would be less impact to use electric from coal as opposed to say burning natural gas in the house. Um, that's fact. That's like how all the math works. And that person was saying non-fact things. And there's no there's no support for that at all. It, it only like it might have been the uh, a gas industry study perhaps that said that or maybe but not even gas industry yeah, not, pull it off. The only way they do it is when they decide to not study heat pumps and they pretend that people would put in electric resistance water heaters or electric resistance uh, space heating. That's their strategy is to put out silly non-studies, you know, to pretend that we're still in the 1980s or something. That's the only way they can figure it out is just to put up misinformation. Uh, that's not how people develop. No one would be putting in electric resistance space heating except in like a passive house, you know, some extremely energy efficient building might see that. Everyone else would use a heat pump. It's just, it, yeah, it's discredited studies, Great. fake studies, that, but, but our government agencies, the IPCC, every independent environmental organization, normal people with a calculator can figure this out. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Nathaniel Altus, an energy engineer with Beyond Efficiency, uh, is asking, doesn't this void a Tesla's battery warranty? Um, he's referring to using your car battery to power your home. It does for Tesla, but Tesla's the only one. The other four that were on that slide, um, they're fine with it. And Tesla's first car, when they came out with the Spider retrofit, that really good looking sports car, that one supported vehicle to building. They backed away from it. Um, so yeah, you're right. You wouldn't do that with Tesla, I guess, unless they sell you the charger, I think is how that would work. And they don't have one yet, but for sure that's what they're thinking. But they also want you to buy their power wall. They want, to, they want you to buy more battery. And this is kind of a strategy to buy less battery. Yeah, and I think the, you know, the automakers are gonna to respond to consumer demand if this becomes a really viable solution that you can power your house during grid outages with your car quite easily, um, people are going to want that, especially here in California. And if Tesla sees that consumer demand, I'm sure they'll respond um, in, in kind, you know, and probably either develop their own system or allow the use of another system with their vehicles. I would be surprised if they don't. Thank you. That's very interesting about the Tesla battery uh, void. Good to know. Um, Jed Holtzman, a senior policy analyst with 350 Bay Area, is asking what role can CCAs play, not just as one-off, but in a coordinated fashion to push adoption of these home technologies to the extent feasible? Well, in a coordinated way, if the CCAs wrote a letter, which they're, they signed on, that asked for the manufacturers to produce certain products, that really works to have a group request, because most of the manufacturers aren't sure if they should come out with heat pump water heaters that are smaller or use less power. You know, they're not sure if ADUs, you know, secondary dwelling units in people's backyards. It, like, they, they, they're not sure if there's any market for things other than what they've been selling. Um, so CCA is saying, hey, we, have, we actually wanna do retrofits. Uh, we, we wanna do it with these products. Um, that I see as being what's worked over in Europe, a program called Energy Sprung, which is sort of the European Union's big effort towards supporting electrification. And it's been signed on to by France and Britain and the Netherlands. Everyone's been signing on. 
the way they've been doing it successfully is sending out group letters saying, you know, we have thousands or hundreds of thousands of units that we are going to do this electrification effort with. So all of us who sign on this letter are asking you to please make products that kind of do that job for us. And, and we, in turn, will incentivize it. We're, we're making a com commitment for long term. It, you know, we have so many laws, all of us in California, New York, and the United States that, that would support that kind of group letter that you could say, going into the future, we're confident that we're going to do this electrification thing. Please help us. Because it is true that we lack some of, um, we don't have a whole lot of our electrification tools of existing buildings. We don't have a lot of water heaters or a lot of anything that's really low power. We have a few. So that'd be my response. Hey, there's also been some utilities that, yeah, and, and there are some utilities in uh, nationally that are being more progressive about actually putting energy storage batteries inside people's homes and using them as an ancillary asset to the grid. There's a utility in Vermont called Green Mountain Power it's actually putting Tesla power walls in people's homes and using it for that purpose. And then the people have the resilience when the power goes out. And also there's a 600 unit apartment building in Utah that's being developed in collaboration between Rocky Mountain Power and Sonnen Battery. Where they're putting a Sonnen battery in every single unit and they're gonna use that, all those batteries as a virtual power plant to support the grid. And then also to provide resilience for that building in the event of grid outages. So, CCAs could certainly do a similar type of thing here in California, I would think. Thanks, guys. Um, Trent Wolby, uh, who uh, is at Google and in Oakland, California, Trent is asking, are there any incentives or resources for tenants to encourage landlords to retrofit to electrification, especially in light of PSPS? Um, I only know of the low income weatherization program, which is for affordable housing. Um, the retrofits, the other programs, they, they don't exist. CCAs don't have, it seems, um, well, SMUD. SMUD has a program that is $13,500 to retrofit homes. That's managed by Efficiency First California. And they've done more than a thousand homes in Sacramento territory. So that, that I think is a best practices. That's an electric utility that I talked with them. They were getting a repayment in 14 years on a 40 year bond. So they're, they're profitable within 14 years by putting almost $14,000 on the table to retrofit people's homes and succeeding you know, a thousand times now in just a couple of years. So I, that would be, yeah, best practice that I can point at, but there's not a whole lot else I would point at. Maybe, you know, if these building owners can see the, say, the long-term savings in going solar, um, electrifying, going solar plus storage systems, savings in their utility costs, and also the benefit of providing healthier, safer, more resilient homes for the tenants that should increase rents, there, you know, there should be a, a good economic case for doing so as well. I don't know if anybody's done a study on that, but that would be an effort worth undertaking, I think. Thank you. Um, Suzanne Emerson is a green building consultant and special inspector for Emerson Environmental. Um, Suzanne is asking, a building department staff have objected to have, have objected that whole building electrification will require PG&E to, tr to replace transformers on electric poles, but that PG&E is very slow at doing this and it will result in long delays in project completion. Can you speak to this? Yeah. That sub panel uh, slide that I showed, it had two products, one by Lumen, the other by Eaton. And both of these are ways in which you can take the exact same power supply you have right now and just keep it. But put in a box below your box, a sub panel. And in that sub panel, wire the new high power loads. And that sub panel will have a computer that says, uh, turn off the water heater for half an hour or turn off the refrigerator, um, or turn off the car charger, three different items that have batteries, or even turn off the air conditioner for 15 minutes. Um, you know, we're cooking a whole bunch of food right now, or whatever. You, you could have choices about what things balance 
Um, but nonetheless, that is the technical solution that requires no upgrade. And an upgrade, Keith Nee would point out, it might be $4,000 or $6,000 or more, uh, especially on their end. Um, these are costs that, that a homeowner might bear. We might have a $4,000 bill for all the things that are involved on the homeowner side of getting a service upgrade, or buy an $800 sub panel and uh, plug loads into that instead. So that would be the solution is uh, load balancing sub panels for a relatively low cost for an order of magnitude less expense. Okay. All right, we've got a lengthy one here. Uh, so just uh, let me know if you need to repeat anything. Um, this is from Alan Best, correspondent with the Energy News Network. Alan asks, uh, a Colorado utility has this to say about air source heat pumps. And I quote, when serving our customers, we always plan for extreme weather, such as the bomb cyclone and pol polar vortex early this year. While these heat pumps show promise, there are some concerns about their performance and efficiency during cold weather, which may, which may impact their ability to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so Alan's asking, what is, your, what is your reaction? How real are the limitations of the technology, whether in Colorado or the Sierra Nevadas? Well, there's all electric heat pump warmed homes above the Arctic Circle and have been for years. Um, I was on this zero to energy leadership thing uh, in 2015 over in Boston and my co-presenter was doing all electric heat pump heated homes above the Arctic Circle up in Canada and he had a whole bunch of them as a habitat studio. So uh, you know we've had all this crazy weather for a few winters in a row and there's an electrify everything Facebook site which is really fun and people post pictures of their indoor thermometers while they there's a photo of their outside and you know we had some crazy cold weather in for instance ohio this year and people were posting 72 and 74 degree warmth inside and they're so happy uh heat pumps are designed to go down to negative 22 fahrenheit while still producing heat before going into electric resistance um negative 22 fahrenheit is incredibly cold and i'm not sure if that's really what they're talking about um you know, that's wind chills are one thing, like negative five with a negative 20 wind chill. Yeah, that's real, but it's not actually negative 20. It's negative five in terms of how a heat pump works. So that's the quick answer is that heat pumps can handle um, Arctic Circle weather and they can certainly handle Colorado. That's where that cold weather is yeah. coming from. It's a polar vortex. So it's less efficient, but it still works. And then, you know, in a, in a situation like that, again, you want to, I would say you'd really want to have some backup energy storage reserve in some form, just in case the grid goes down, you know, that's, that's smart. If you're in a potentially life-threatening situation from cold weather, um, that would be smart. And, and also to have your building so efficient that it could endure a period of time, you know, in very frigid temperatures because of its efficiencies, right? Yeah, you know, my dad had to be evacuated from his house in Wisconsin when the propane wouldn't flow anymore because it was too cold outside, but his electricity was still working. So you know, that is relying upon fossil fuels as your backup doesn't always work out. Um, if electricity goes out, of course, the furnace fan is controlled by it. So you don't get heat if the electricity is out. You frequently don't get hot water either. You can't dry your laundry, of course, and only the stove might work. But as I illustrated in my slides, there's very little cooking energy that's being used every day. And a small amount of vehicle to building support or islanding your house with a solar array or other things can be done <clears throat> for those crises. But um, you know, downtown Arcata, during our most recent power outage, are the, the historical storefronts, there's eight of them in a row. The restaurant, which is kindly, you know, keeping open and serving food, their generator caught fire and it's destroyed almost the whole city block. So all of the plumbing and wiring, all these buildings are gutted. Everyone's had to move out. All the businesses are closed because of the generator that was going to keep the restaurant going. Ironically, the one person in town who runs his house off of his car was next door, Solutions, like the green goods store, and they're the ones that are closed down also for the Christmas season. 
So I don't encourage people to look at explosive, dangerous fossil fuels as a solution during a crisis. It creates its own crisis frequently. Thank you. One more question for you guys. Um, Steve Schmidt, the manager at Home Energy Analytics Incorporated, is asking when the DC Bell and the 120 volt Nuos Evo water heater will be available in the California. Any idea? So the Decibel um, is going to be available on the market in March 2020. It is projected they're going to start production in January and will be on the market in, by March. Um, that's the latest information I have uh, from Asiaco. Great, thank and you. Then, and um, there is in January, there's going to be a science fair, it's being called, that SMUD is holding. So the people coming in with retrofit ready heat pump water heaters, the ones that are you know, 120 volt plug it in anywhere. Uh, so Ream, AO Smith, um, we might see HTP, the, the people who are uh, making that new OS Evo, that little gel cap one, they'll be coming in with their products. And uh, so look forward to that. I think that you know, we don't have, like I said, we don't have all the tools that we need. We don't have all the products now, but we're, they're coming onto the market soon. And I think for all the policy people on this um, call that this is the right time to start making policies that support the world that we're trying to create. And we're, you know, most of the problems are solved, like the sub panel, for instance, you don't need a retrofit ready heat pump water heater if you put in a, a load balancing sub panel. You know, so I, I think that we should be moving forward right away you know um like you know there's it'd be great if we had more things but we have enough absolutely all right well thank you to you both um we are out of time but i uh, thank you so much for for uh, answering those questions uh, and for anyone who submitted questions we couldn't get to we apologize um we um we do have another webinar coming up on December 11th and then another one in January. We'll be getting some information about that in the next couple of days. Uh, so thanks everyone for attending. And again, thank you, Sean, and thank you, John. Thank you so much. This is a real pleasure. Anytime. Likewise, thanks. All right, have a great week, everybody. You too. Bye-bye.